I'm so goddamn tired. I've already done this stream twice. The first time was at the assigned time when I usually do it. And for some dumbass reason, I had my microphone off. So there was no sound. Luckily, I noticed this. And because I noticed it, I was able to go, well, shit. And that led me to do the stream again a couple hours later after taking a break to let my voice recover because an hour of streaming is kind of murder on your voice. And when I did the stream again, about half an hour into it, I switched monitors to uh, to show something from a text I was looking at, and then I went on to talk extensively about a drawing that was not on the screen. So for 20 minutes, I was talking about something you couldn't see and saying, look over here, we're going to do it like this, we're going to do it like that, we'll do it with a wiffle ball bat. And that would have sucked. That would have been a shitty last half of that stream. So, so I have to do a stream again. <laughs> and I'm kidding. I'm, I'm not that broken up about having to do the stream again, but God, it's tedious. And God, it's tiring. And I've been streaming for six hours while streaming or getting ready to stream. And uh, actually, it's been longer than that because I spent a couple hours getting ready to stream before I did it the first time. I am so goddamn tired. Oh my fucking god. It is almost five o'clock in the goddamn morning, and I've been up all fucking night, which I did not fucking plan. So, <laughs> so in any case, um,. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay, so. What we're going to be talking about tonight, what we're going to cover primarily, is that um, I need to do more finished work, which I've talked about before. And uh, and last week, I kind of showed this. I showed this thing that I've been blocking out, and I've spent all week looking at it and going, that's not right. It needs to be different, and I don't know why, and I don't know what needs to be different about it, but we're going to talk about it for the third fucking time. Um, I've already... I went through the process live in the first stream and talked about exactly what I was thinking and when I was thinking it. And then in the second stream, I kind of reenacted that, where I said, okay, here's the stuff that I've been thinking, and I walked through it because... Well, because, oh God, so much stuff, so much goddamn stuff. Um, anyway, God, my eyes are tired. Um, my head moderator sent me a whole bunch of stuff. He sent me a uh, a new monitor to replace the monitor that I broke early last year or late last year, and uh, and he sent me a new 4K drawing tablet so that I could work in higher resolution. Um, I'm kind of blown away by that. Like, I, I don't typically have friends who buy me stuff like drawing tablets. I mean, I have in the past. I've got a, I've got a number of very nice things that were purchased for me as gifts, but... It's been a long time since I had a friend like that, and the, friends are harder to come by as you get older, and being in my 50s, it it means so, so very, very much to have somebody that uh, that is so thoughtful and so generous, and, uh, and that has been that has been a good friend for as long as Locke has. And that's, uh, it's just mind-blowing to me. 
because uh, I, I always feel like I don't really know how to be anybody's friend, and I don't know why people are friends with me most of the time. I, I don't feel like I'm a great friend. I don't feel like I'm hugely fun or useful to be around, but he, uh, he reminds me quite frequently that he comes to me for advice and that, uh, and then I help him out with stuff that nobody else can help him with. And, and I guess like, is, is that being a good friend? I've never had a friend like that. I've never had a friend who could give me advice. I don't know. It, it it would be nice if I did have I did have a friend that could give me advice, and then uh, and then one day he decided we weren't friends anymore. I don't really know what happened. I don't know. I'm I'm not gonna think too much about it. I'm I'm gonna get all weird and funky and maudlin and shit like that. But. He also sent me a boatload of books. And that that's interesting because um because the first one this this is amazing and it really kind of bears on something that I've never really talked about here which is we don't teach as well as we used to anymore and and i know that's like that's a thing that old people say that old people go you know we don't we don't it, it just, it's been 50 years since we did a good job of this thing but it's not like that because the world is constantly getting better okay i mean i I could give you such a laundry list of all the stuff in the 70s that was so much fucking worse than it is today, okay? And, and like, even, even if you come at it from the absolutely ridiculous notion that, uh, that the Internet is somehow a bad thing, even if you, even if you suggest no, you know the cell phones in your pocket. You don't need a cell phone in your pocket. You don't need the internet. Even if you assume that all of the wonderful communications and stuff like that are uh, are not great and they're not wonderful and they've ruined society or what have you, you know what definitely hasn't ruined society is that I cannot remember the last time I saw maggots. I used to see maggots all the fucking time in the 70s. I used to there used to be stray dogs roaming through neighborhoods and stray cats that would attack you if you got too close to them. And the feral cats that were breeding beyond control. And there would be and there would be dead animals in the street that nobody did anything about for weeks. And the amount of that has dropped so tremendously that, you know, it's, I think like three years ago, we had a dead possum on the, on the edge of our property. And we noticed it the day after it happened, it had to have happened during the night. And we chucked it in the trash and it was taken care of. It, <laughs> So much stuff was so much worse. Sanitation and hygiene and, and just general, I mean, there used to be fights and not just like schoolyard fights, but grown adults would have fist fights in the street commonly during the 70s. And that's weird now. It's fucking weird when people have a fist fight in public. That's not a thing that happens all the time anymore. And it's good that it's not a thing that happens all the time. But you listen to a lot of these people and they just sit there and they go all the way, oh, once upon a time men used to be men. No, once men used to be out of fucking control, going around beating the crap out of anything that annoyed them. That was not better. There was not an improvement over today. <laughs> it's... Anyway, I, I don't want to go off on this. I've God, I've been ranting about this shit for like 10 minutes. 
this stream is either going to suck or it's going to be the best stream you've ever seen me do because I'm fucking punch drunk. Anyway, the first of the books is Robert Gill's Rendering with Pen and Ink. This book is fantastic because it goes into such tremendous detail about how exactly to render what you're trying to render. And it covers everything you need to know. It covers, like, look, look at this. I, I had this issue with, uh, with how measuring lines work several months ago. It, it's all explained in here. And, it, and there's all kinds of shit. Here's, like, how to draw cars. I've got a whole book on how to draw cars. It sucks. This is better than that whole goddamn book. There's like five or six pages on this that I've gone through, and it's just, it's so much better than the whole fucking book I got on drawing cars. They cover more material in a half dozen pages of this book than they covered in that whole goddamn book, because people these days suck at teaching. They suck at instruction. They leave stuff out all the time. Here's a bunch of stuff about drawing trees. Here's here's a bunch of stuff about how to render water. And and this is all just black and white stuff, you know? There's a, there's coverage here. I just flipped right past this. There's coverage here they're talking about um they're talking about furniture. They're talking about drawing furniture. Okay? And uh, and and they just mentioned God damn it! Now I can't find it, and I don't know where it was. And they mentioned specifically that um, that the vanishing points of a piece of furniture differ by how it is rotated. I had to figure that out on my own. It took me years. Nobody ever explained that to me. And here we've got this book that was written in 1972. We knew how to fucking teach back then. And uh, and this is this guy did a really great job. And I'm not going to say we need the gatekeepers back on publishing, because there's a lot of there's a lot of great stuff that's being published now that didn't used to get published at all ever because people went not enough. There's not enough of a market. Not enough people will buy it. And uh, and it's great that you can publish something that'll sell two copies, like I did. I published a book. It sold two copies. Uh, it's okay. It's I, I I don't feel bad about it. Like not not one bit. Um, I'm not gonna waste my time writing another book for a while. <laughs> but um, but this uh, this book is really really amazing, and I really appreciate that. That's what makes great gifts, you know, and you're buying somebody a gift. It needs to be something they'll actually appreciate. And uh, and Locke has done a fantastic job of that. He got me this book on learning the kanji because I'm going to need it. And the reason I'm going to need it is because the rest of the books he sent me are half Japanese. And I don't mean half of the book is in Japanese and the other half is in English. I mean the book is half Japanese. If you actually read Japanese books or manga, then you know even when they're translated into English, like this copy of uh, Junji Ido's Gyo, they open from right to left. That's how they work. That's how it flows. But these books, they're 100% in Japanese, but they open left to right. They're half Japanese. The book is written in Japanese, but it's not a Japanese book. It's a Western book, which is odd. I've never seen that happen before. And, uh, and all of these books being in Japanese, I will not translate the titles, but tell you what these books are, because I've flipped through them, and I've translated the titles, which is relatively easy, because you can go through um, Google or Bing, and you just take a picture with your phone, and you, you go, hey, I translate the text in this. And it doesn't do a bad job, necessarily, but it doesn't do a good one. 
and um, my Japanese is terrible. I can't read Japanese for shit, but um, I know enough Japanese to recognize that a lot of these translations were really, really off. So uh, this one is about drawing beautiful anime girls. And uh, and that was that was the translation beautiful anime girls, and and I but I recognize enough Japanese to recognize that this does say beautiful girls. So uh, this covers both Clip Studio Paint and there's a chapter on Paint Tool Sai. The chapter on Paint Tool Sai is the uh, the shortest one, and uh, and I don't use Paint Tool Sai, but the two chapters on Clip Studio Paint are going to be very useful and. I just need to, um, I, I, I need to learn how to read Japanese so I understand these instructions. That's kind of important. And there's a, there's a lot of really interesting stuff in here that you don't find in a lot of books, like apparently how to draw ice cream. That's interesting. I, I um, wonder why they have that in there. When I can read it, I'll be able to figure it out. And the next thing is, this one's an anatomy book. And this is a very good anatomy book because when you get to the, uh, when you get to the end of the chapter on the human torso and, and they cover like the front of the human torso, like here's where they're covering the back of it. And then you flip the page and it starts to be things that I can't put on YouTube or they'll get mad and um, and it has it has information on drawing the breasts that is important and that is missed by most anatomy books. It's like the first thing I check in an anatomy book is to see whether they actually covered this particular important information about the uh, axillary process and where the breast actually starts and ends. Uh, there's another book later on that gets this wrong. Um, this one's on rendering skin. This is a particular issue that I have. So again, Locke kind of looked at my specific needs and said, this is particular to what he needs to work on. And that's excellent. And this is, this is really very well done. There's a lot of detail in here. And, um, and the Japanese seems fairly simple. I can almost read some of it. Not enough to get context, you know, but I could get like this word here and that word there, and I can sound out the kana. There's a whole book on clothing. Again, something that I need to work on, and it covers both male and female clothing, which is something that a lot of books like this don't do. They just go, here's how to draw clothes on girls. Like, um, like this book, which is how to draw clothes on girls. Specifically, very frilly, fancy, formal, old style clothes, which is nice because that's exactly what I need for uh, for this piece that I'm working on. The piece that you could see right now, okay? Right now over, over here, up in this area here. Uh, Chio is going to be wearing an outfit kind of like one of these, this kind of thing with like a frilly skirt and whatnot, and um, and figure out how to draw that is going to be important because she's got to wear it, and I've got to draw her wearing it, which means I need to know how to draw that thing. Then uh, this one's about underwear. Um, somebody understands exactly where my interests lie. And then here's the book that um here's the book on how to uh how to draw hentai girls. Uh Google said this was how to draw slightly naive girls, <laughs> which I find <laughs> terribly terribly funny. But uh yeah. This uh this book is completely wrong about how you're supposed to draw breasts. Just unapologetically wrong about it so um yeah <laughs> and that's kind of important but uh, but that's par for the course with a lot of, i i don't i don't think some of these people 
some of these artists that are writing about how to draw breasts, I, I, I don't think they've ever seen titties. I, I, don't, I don't think they know how titties work and how they fit onto the body. I just don't think they know. This entire book is on facial expressions. It is nothing but facial expressions, and that is amazing. It actually has, like, older people, which I'm going to need to know, obviously. And it talks about posture. It talks about uh, different poses. It talks about the, uh, the shape language of anime eyes, which I've talked about somewhat. And it's really, really well done. So I expect to learn a tremendous amount from these. And then on top of that, there are a pair of pose books. And, uh, and they're both just like photographs of naked women. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to show you any of the insides of those. But, um, yeah, they, I've, got a, I've got a substantial increase in my library here. Thanks to my head moderator, who uh, also does a great job over on the Discord server. And um, these are definitely being added to my library so I can make use of them at a later point in time. God, 20 minutes. I spent 20 minutes doing that. I'm tired. I'm fucking tired. I've been doing this all goddamn night. But anyway, anyway, there's a lot of work that I need to do on this piece. Now, I've talked, uh, I've talked a little bit about this. I didn't talk much about this last week. But, um, but here's the thing about this, okay, is um, I've done some, uh, some fairly complex and, uh, and fairly good work. Like uh, like this picture of Gargura, which I did a year and a half ago. That's a long time. I haven't really finished any piece since this. And looking at it now, I'm like, wow, this this is not that great. I could do a much better job now. And... Um, and this is literally the best piece of work I've ever done. So I should really do another piece of work like today. Not like literally today, but knowing what I know today, working from what I know today. And what I decided to work on is, uh, is a picture of Chio one of the characters from Groping Festival. And uh, and this is her. And I've got a lot of notes on this particular character because I've got notes on all of the characters. And, uh, and Chio in particular is, uh, she's found on a, um, let me come over here. She's found on a playground at night. It's a nighttime level. She's in a playground, and she's the uh, she's the she's the woman as mystic archetype, and she represents inner divinity, the uh, the interior hidden divinity of womankind, and um, and she represents. One of two elements. It depends on whether I'm going to use Chinese or Japanese elements. I think I'm going to use Japanese, but originally I was using Chinese because I didn't have enough information on the Japanese elements. And uh, and kind of the difference is that it, if you've watched Avatar The Last Airbender, which the, uh, the new live-action version they just came out with, is burning garbage. Just don't waste your fucking time. It's the 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 actors playing Katara and Sokka are doing a very good job, but everybody else just sucks. They're all phoning it in. Um, Appa looks awful, and uh, and the kid playing Ang. He sucks. He's awful. He can't fucking act. He, I, I, I just, I'm... 
I wish I could say I'm mystified as to how they did such a bad job, but I know exactly how they did such a bad job. Nobody fucking cares. They said this show's for kids. Nobody cares about a show for kids. Fuck it. It can just be crap. It can be unmitigated crap, and nobody will care. And, um... And I'm terribly, terribly sad that we're still in that place when it comes to entertainment aimed at children. Because the best entertainment aimed at children is entertainment that recognizes the children are watching it with their parents. That's why after, God, it's like 60, 70 years, people still fondly remember Bullwinkle and Rocky because it had jokes that were in there for the parents who were watching with their kids. And we don't do that anymore. We make shows that are for adults and shows that are for children and we split them up and we don't really have shows that are for parents to watch with their kids that the parents can literally fucking enjoy. The Muppet Show was like that in the 70s. God damn it, I'm, I'm reminiscing again and going, yeah! It's been 50 years since things were as good as they used to be. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be like that. I really don't. That's, I fucking hate it when people do that. Um, anyway. Um, the four elements that you may have been introduced to in Avatar The Last Airbender are earth, air, fire, and water. In Chinese alchemical elements, there is no air, there is metal. And in addition to that, there is wood. So you've got earth, air, fire, metal, and wood. But there's also a Japanese series of elements, and that's your standard earth, air, fire, and water. And then the fifth one is void, it's nothing. And I find that an intriguing addition. But, um, but thus far, in the, uh, in the notes for the, uh, for the Pantsugami, I've been using the, uh, I've been using the Chinese elements. But anyway, there, there's a, there are a lot of notes on these. There's a lot of lore on them. But um, Chio appears in a playground at night in the game. And she's a creepy adversarial figure that functions as an enemy in the first game. She's a player avatar in the second, although she has to be unlocked later in the game. A lot more work has been done on these games than you've seen. <laughs> but I wanted to do a scene in the school playground at night with Chio. And I blocked this in a week and a half ago. And I said, this is wrong. There is a bunch of stuff wrong with this, and I don't know what it is, but it doesn't feel right. And if you've been watching my streams for any real length of time, you know that um, you know that I'm a particular fan of Monet, and this is uh, this is his Olive Groves at Moreno painting. And if you saw my stream last week about painting trees, then you know my skills are pretty much on par with this. Like this, um, this particular style of painting right here, this tree, I could paint this tree. It would not be terribly difficult for me to paint this tree. It would not be terribly difficult for me to shade and light it and put the foliage on it. And uh, and because of that, I'm kind of feeling my oats on this and going, I should work more on this. What I'd really want, of course, is something that's kind of a um, kind of a crossbreed between Monet's olive trees and Van Gogh's olive trees. 
Because you see here, these have line art. They have line art and the uh, and the shading has that kind of layered striped effect that I was getting on the stream last week. So I want to do something that's kind of in between both of those as far as trees go. But um, but with regard to uh, with regard to this particular scene, um, I've talked about Monet's ability to guide you through the scene before. I should have left that picture open. But uh, the thing about Monet guiding you through the scene is that uh, here we have this pathway that he's leading you through. This is the gateway that you're kind of going through on this path. And there's this embankment to guide you around. And you've got some things to see off to the side. You've got these trees, obviously, that serve as the frame. And you've got another tree over here, and you've got some foliage. you got a tree up here on the hill. But your real focus is these trees here, where you kind of break into the light on your way out of the grove. And he leads you through that. There's a sense to this painting of transition. Here's the place that you are, and here's the place that you're going, and here's all the space around that where you're not going. And what I want to do is I want to create that same kind of sense where the image, where the painting pulls you in, where it pulls you forward, and it tells something of a story. And the story that I wanted to tell is, hey, you're walking through a playground at night and there's this creepy fucking girl hanging off the monkey bars. Like she's going to pounce on you. It's some kind of predatory bullshit going on here. And it's creepy and it's fucked up. And you should probably turn around and go the other way. And that's the feeling that I'm looking for here. Chio, Chio's creepy and she's supposed to be creepy. And it's going to be a, at night or at sunset, and the lighting is going to be dramatic, and it's just going to—that's kind of the thing that I'm going for here. But I haven't done a good job with this, because this particular thumbnail overlooks something important. See, if we—if um, I come down here, and I— sort of diagram out where you are standing right here. And you're looking forward down along here, but um, the monkey bars are somewhat higher than that. And here's Chio at the top of the monkey bars. So Chio is up here. kind of hanging off to the side, and you're over here. So your eye line has to go up like this. And if your eye line is directed up to put Chio at the center of your vision, instead of having the center of your vision just be like right here, and you're looking at her feet, which I know a lot of people are into, but if we're going to center Chio as the subject, your eye line is pointed up. And if your eye line is pointed up, well, you can't do two point perspective. You got to do three point perspective. So um, that's important. That means that these lines over here, over here, this is where I need to switch back to the drawing. This is where I need to not phone it in and fuck it up. So instead of these lines here being straight, these lines can't be straight. I'm looking up, and because I'm looking up, these lines tilt back. And they tilt back more dramatically the farther you move forward. And it creates this tilt to the scene. 
and that tilt to the scene, which I'm exaggerating here, that tilt gives it a sense of urgency and tension that was missing. And that urgency and tension makes Chio more creepy. And that's what I'm looking for. And you would get the same thing over here with the building where it would be kind of tilted, but in the opposite direction. And it would get more pronounced as you got farther back, except for one thing. And that one thing is, if this is the top of the monkey bars, why are the monkey bars three and a half stories high? Because a Japanese school building is like... It, it's three or four stories, okay? The top of the monkey bars is like... It's going to be right about here. That's where the top of your monkey bars is going to be. It's not going to be way up here. It's not going to be over here. We don't have 20-foot monkey bars. That's fucking ridiculous. So that's entirely out of scale. Either that's entirely out of scale or this is entirely out of scale. And if we put this in scale, it ends up way too small. That's too big. <coughs> and because that's too big, it dominates the scene where this small set of monkey bars would just have Chio hanging off of the side, and it just wouldn't be all that interesting. It would be more like an Easter egg and less like the focus of the piece. So uh, so that's wrong, that uh, we can't do things that way. And what I've been looking at is... I've been looking at this particular piece because there's something I like about it. And what I like about it is these windows right here. These windows kind of look like eyes. And if you focus them correct, if you have them in the right position and the light is coming from the right direction, that could be really striking. That could really kind of lead your eye into where you want it to go. So I like that. That's the kind of thing that I want to be looking at here is if we start from a new image, I want that tower to be kind of in the middle, okay? And that tower being in the middle, it's going to have this kind of eyes looking down thing going on. And the sides are going to converge, but just a little bit because it's in the center. It's a kind of a monument. This would draw your eye, but then off to the side, you got the, uh, off to the side, you got the school building here. And way far forward, you have the uh, you have the monkey bars, and up here you have Chio hanging off of the monkey bars. So she is located about here, and she's in this weird pose and just kind of clutching on to these monkey bars with her feet in a strange fashion that, you know, human beings don't normally do. And then this would be like, it would be a sunset or night sky, probably more of a night sky. And then this area here, I want that to be this kind of... I want it to be this sort of red brick patio thing that's going on here, you know? I want it to be this sort of thing. And I like this tree. I like this bare tree right here. And I like this lamppost. I want to do something with that lamppost. So, what I'm thinking about doing with that is over here, we're going to place the lamppost. So, the lamppost is going to be here. And it's going to be at roughly the same distance as the monkey bars. So it's going to shine this kind of dramatic lighting on Chio. And way back behind it, we're going to have like some 
trees and some foliage. And I think the way to do that is to have like, I think we want the trees sort of twisted and pointing off in this. No, they wouldn't do that. They wouldn't do that because of being near the building. Being near the building, the wind would hit the building, move alongside it, and it would drive the trees off in this direction. And then that, that could still draw the eye toward Chio as the subject, but it would also look like the trees themselves are trying to get away from her. So we got this kind of patio here. And uh, maybe we should work with this building instead. Maybe this is the more appropriate building to use for that. Maybe we focus it on this. Maybe what we want is something like this. Does it really read as uh, as being at night? If we had a set of monkey bars here, if they set in roughly this location here, like the same place that this gate is, that is probably about four or five feet, so the monkey bars could go a little bit farther up, and then Chio could be hanging off of that right around here in this creepy weird pose and if we deleted that part of the building and just kind of had tower here come down then we could have the night sky back behind her this light here would still give us the light source from over in that direction. And we'd have this little, we'd have this little kind of garden here. And then we could have the creepy dead tree in the middle. And that might actually be That might be a better compositional layout. Of course, it does sort of beg the question, what are you doing walking up to the school at night? But if you're just walking past it instead of walking up to it, And that kind of, let's look at our rule of thirds concept here. Yeah, let's, um, let's focus in there and let's take a look at if we do the rule of thirds and we just go. Okay, so if we have kind of border running around like this and we divide it up in thirds then our major focus area 
We do have Chio sitting close to that point. I think the uh, the best way to handle this is to expand it outward. Let's pull that back. Let's go. Um, let's go substantially larger. And now we've got our got our lamp there. We've got Chio there. So what if lower? If we go lower, then our thirds give us the lamp right there, it gives us Chio's face right there, and it gives us this tree that is kind of in that space. And then the rest of it is all the building. That, that may be the right layout for this. So if we do it kind of like that, And we remove all of this, so that is all just sky. Then Chio's kind of at the border there. And if she's sitting in that space, that would draw attention to her. And you'd still have kind of this notion that she's blocking your path, that you're headed here, but she's in the path waiting for you. We really want to make sure that this little kind of garden area here looks inviting enough that you want to go there. Yeah, I kind of like this layout idea. So let's, um, kind of outline that area right there. Okay, I think the right way to do this is to merge that down and then we'll and we'll just rectangle select. Um, actually, let's get rid of that and just rectangle select. If we just rectangle select, Take a piece about this size here. Let's, um, okay, so let's copy that. And we'll come over to our uh, illustration two. And we'll uh, add a new layer, paste into that. Then we'll control T. See how that looks. Then we can expand it a bit upward. I 
we can still do these windows here. We can still do the windows in uh, in this space right over here. And still do these windows in this tower. And they can be more uh, can be more angled to the side. And we can still get the dramatic lighting here. Maybe instead of the tree, we have a merry-go-round in the center here. That's a terrible drawing, but... I could try that both ways. That's what she said. Um, maybe we want the moon up here in the corner. If we use the moon... Then we can uh, then we can excuse a fairly large amount of ambient light and prevent this from being too dramatic. So it's not too overly stark, and we'll have enough detail on this stuff to see what it is. Um, I think the merry-go-round would uh, get in the way of things. So I think we stick with just the tree. Okay, so let's uh, let's turn that off. We'll zoom out on it. Control A and Control C. I'll come back over here and we'll drop this into reference. So it's Control V to get that into reference. Uh, no, Control Z. Um, back over here. Make sure you get the right layer when you. Copy stuff. Then we'll uh, control T to transform and we'll, uh, we'll pull that out. Drag that over. Let me see here. Let's uh, let's try and put the right pieces in the right places.
Okay, so that's uh, that's a good place for the reference. That's about the right place that I want stuff to go. I still have this bit. There's something foreboding about this entrance, and I like that to be kind of foreboding. Okay, yeah, this is a um this is a fairly good look and uh and I think I have finally got I have finally got a stream that I can upload. <laughs> Fucking finally. Oh my god. It is almost six o'clock in the goddamn morning. I am so fucking tired. Um, anyway, thanks for showing up. I appreciate you. I always appreciate you. Do the little YouTube dance, like, comment, subscribe, hit the little bell icon, all that happy horse shit. And, uh, Fucking hell, finally, I've got this done, so okay, bye.